Hello there, my name is Dr. Thayeth. I am a consultant pediatrician with expertise in cardiology working at James Budget Hospital in Norfolk. Today I'm going to talk about uh, Dijot syndrome. The new ter terminology for that is 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. Quite a mouthful, so I'm just going to call it Dijot or 22Q11DS. For, uh, to make it less confusing. So I want to draw attention right at the beginning to this particular document which is really useful in managing patients with Dijord syndrome. It's called uh, the consensus document on 22Q11DS. Uh, it can be found on the Max web Appeal website so if you just go on to Google and type in Max Appeal consensus document you should be able to get hold of this a fairly long document the various subsection and just refer to the section you're interested in. Now I have a little uh, uh, case uh, to go with just to make it a bit more interesting. So my little lad here was uh, a male uh, born at 38 plus 6 weeks of gestation so not too early. Normal delivery, birth weight was a bit on the lower side. He did not need an resuscitation at birth. Antenatally he has a diagnosis of interrupted aortic arch and ventricular septal defect. Amniocentesis was dis declined by parents, so we did not have any genetic confirmation of Dijord syndrome before birth. Uh, so just going through uh, what Dijord syndrome is, the most useful phrase to actually know is the CATCH-22. Uh, CATCH syndrome as uh, uh, you can sort of uh, say what can go wrong in this. C stands for cardiac abnormalities. A stands for abnormal mouth, ear and face. So uh, you could get uh, cleft lip, cleft palate, uh, um, abnormal ears, uh, dysmorphic features, etc. You can have a T stands for an absent thymus. The second C stands for a cleft lip and a cleft palate. And uh, the H stands for hypercalcemia, which is as a result of the parathyroid gland uh, missing. 22 stands for the deletion. So this is a fairly big deletion uh, of 1.5 to 3 megabytes on the long arm of the 22nd chromosome. It's uh, well known that it's an autosomal, commonest autosomal dominant deletion in humans. So this is what uh, we usually do a test called the FISH test, uh, which can be done on the blood sample in the child uh, or uh, on the chorionic villi sampling or the amniocentesis. So uh, normally in a normal 22nd chromosome, you will see the red dots as well as the green dots. So this is the normal 22nd chromosome. And here is the abnormal 22nd chromosome where you just have the green dots. So it's a bit like your buttonhole being present or the button being missing. So 95% of them can be diagnosed by fish, but 5% can be missed. So the importance of getting the genetic teams involved early on. So they are other tests which are superior, for example, MLPA is superior. Now, the gene which is responsible for the condition is uh, known to be TBX1, and it controls the development of the third and the fourth pharyngeal arches. So you can easily recognize why you would get problem with your thyroid, your parathyroid, why you would get cleft lip and palate. But it's interesting to see why they would get cardiac abnormality, which happens to be the main problem when they're born. born. So if you look at this particular picture, this is the human embryo when it's about five to six weeks of age. You can see the neuro neural crest cells are migrating through the third and fourth arches into the conotruncus of the heart. So the conotruncus forms your pulmonary artery and your aorta. So you can see these crest cells are migrating and uh, to begin with in embryo embryology, you have just one common trunk and uh, these cells migrate and septate them and transform them into the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So you can see if the septum is not forming, if these cells are not migrating properly, you can have problems with the pulmonary artery, which is the right ventricular outflow tract, or your aorta, which is your left ventricular outflow tract. These migrating cells also migrate further downwards to actually form part of the ventricular septum. So you can also see why it can cause ventricular septal defect. 
So you can get a variety of different problems. So if there's something wrong with the right ventricular outflow tract, you could get pulmonary atresia with or without VSD. If there's uh, something wrong with the aorta, you can have a hypoplastic arch, if you can have co-optation of the aorta, etc. Or you can more commonly get an interrupted aortic arch, where the aortic arch is not complete. <clears throat> so in our particular case, so this is just to go through what are the different problems. So if there's a problem with the RVOT, you can get pulmonary atresia, you can get a Trollgia fellow, LVOT problems, you can get interruption and small aortic arch and narrow aortic arch. You could also get uh, ventricular septal defect, as we said earlier. You could get to truncus arteriosus, uh, which is a condition where you don't have the two separate pulmonary artery and aorta. Instead, you just have one single vessel, uh, which forms your aorta and the pulmonary artery. So this is called truncus. So these are the common conditions which you could get. So just to give, give a brief idea of what interruption of the aortic arch is. So normally the arch would look a little bit like this. You can see the arch is uh, just... Uh, continues like that there's no interruption anywhere in this particular case you can see the first second and thir third branch come off normally and then there is an interruption so the descending aorta is actually supplied by the patent ductus arteriosus so this condition will be a duct dependent lesion so we have to be on prostin straight after birth this is the other condition which i mentioned where you don't have a separate pulmonary artery and uh, aorta instead you have one single vessel and from this single vessel, you have the pulmonary artery coming off on either sides there and your aorta coming off here. Um, so this is a more complex condition. So this is a particular type of truncus where you have truncus arteriosus with interruption. As you can see, the aorta goes up there and then stops and the descending aorta is supplied by the ductus. Now, how do we diagnose it antenatally? You can see in a fetal scan, the left ventricle is quite small compared to the right ventricle so that would raise suspicion straight away that something's wrong with the um, LVOT here so it could be either a co-optation or an interruption this is a normal arch view in a fetus a nice hockey stick with three branches coming off in interruption you can see that the first and second branch comes off normally but the third branch uh, is not coming off there and the hockey stick is not well formed you would have expected something to be like that uh, but instead you know that bit is missing. Another picture here, normal one here, and an abnormal here. And you can see the aortas coming up, first, second, and third branch coming up normally, but then there is interruption. So this is type A interruption, where you have all three branches coming off and then interrupt. And then this is the second type of interruption, which is type B interruption, which is the most common type of interruption. We have the first and second branch coming off and then you have an interruption. So either way, you start these babies on prostin as soon as they're born and transfer them for cardiac surgery. Full corrective repair is possible. So let me just play you a couple of uh, videos here just to... Uh, right. So you can see in this particular case uh, the arch is arch looks normal but you can't you can see that the first and second branch is not coming off there only the third branch is coming off the descending aorta so that means there's an interruption because the descending aorta is somewhere else so you're essentially cutting uh, this is a view across the ductus arteriosus and the descending aorta so this huge thing you're seeing is the ductus arteriosus supplying the descending aorta and if you look at this picture you can see the uh, ascending aorta coming up like that and giving off the first and second branches but there's an interruption there this is another condition where you have a ventricular septal defect you have the left ventricle have the right ventricle you have a hole in the middle there so that's your uh, ventricular septal defect so this is the third condition i mentioned uh, earlier which is the truncus arteriosus instead of having two separate aorta and pulmonary artery you just have one big vessel there which is uh, supplying both the systemic circulation and the pulmonary circulation there <clears throat> this is yet another example of they have a child with a small arch and co-optation so if i play that for you you can see the arch the size of the arch is uh, the size of the arch is pretty small look at the arch is pretty small and then when it comes to about 
at uh, this particular point you can see that there is also an obstruction there so hyperplastic arch and coarctation so all in all you just have to remember that uh, you can have problems of the LVOT which would be your uh, interrupted aortic arch or coarctation you can have problems with your RVOT which would give rise to atrology of fallow or pulmonary atresia you can have problems uh, with VSD or just a common trunk it's called truncus arteriosus so these are the four four broad things you need to keep in mind for most of these conditions you can do a definitive repair and uh, uh, results look promising but they usually need multiple operation as they grow older now what happened to our young man so he was started on prostin straight away and he was transferred to uh, a cardiac center so this is how it would have looked like to the surgeon so the aorta is coming up like that and then it suddenly stops after giving off the first and second branch so there's a gap there so the surgeon is going to get rid of your your duct duct is a very unreliable friend so you need to get rid of him and then you do a side-to-side -side anastomosis like that. You can also see that in this particular case, the surgeon has used a patch uh, uh, to actually uh, improve the size of the iota because the arch was pretty small. Uh, so you won't improve that otherwise. The results won't be good enough. Our condition also, our particular child also had a ventricular septal defect, which was also uh, done at the same time. When they opened the chest, they found that the ch child had no thymus, so the suspicion of having a DeGeorge syndrome uh, was stronger, and obviously genetics confirmed that he has the particular deletion. So, over the next few slides, we will talk about the pro other problems uh, which uh, these can bring, these diagnoses can bring. So, post operative period was normal. He recovered pretty well and was uh, discharged uh, home by before the end of second week. Uh, the other things to bear in mind is I said that this is a problem of the third and fourth arch so you can have thyroid issues we checked his thyroid which was normal which is good but we'll need to keep repeating it every year or two his calcium was normal but uh, again you it's about 30 percent of them have calcium issues so keep repeating it every year to make sure that the calcium is normal keep giving them uh, vitamin D at a recommended daily elements even if the calcium is normal because that can help uh, Thirdly, they can have issues with uh, low lymphocyte count and immunity. His lymphocyte count was normal, so it was only, sorry, it was low. It was only 2.5. Um, now, 1% um, of all patients with DeGeorge can have a really severe immune problem, but the rest of the 99% actually do pretty well. So, uh, apart from all we have to do is we have to do a uh, lymphocyte subset. When we see these patients, if the CD4 count is more than 400, uh, we can have the MMR vaccine uh, and carry on with the normal routine immunization, except not giving BCG. So don't give them BCG without taking specialist advice, especially if the count is low. Uh, but generally, as long as the CD4 count is more than 400, you can have uh, all the rest of the vaccines, including MMR. Um, some of these kids can have uh, um, recurrent chest infection. So make sure it's not aspiration by doing a video fluoroscopy and if that's normal it's unlikely to be aspiration in which case they just need antibiotic prophylaxis now if the, the cd4 count is extremely low they are very vulnerable and they can get uh, severe infection and uh, we should get specialist advice from immunologist consider for thymus transplant may need a frequent ivig infusion cover for fungus bacteria and virus but this is fortunately very very low uh, so it shouldn't be a problem uh, practically really because in the incidence is only one in four thousand to six thousand so as a pediatrician it's likely that you might look after three or four of them but uh, um, you know, the chance of getting one of them is pretty rare so in our particular case the cd4 count was 600 which is above 400 threshold so i went ahead and uh, uh, gave the vaccines one of the other things which would be useful to do is actually uh, test the response to vaccination. So when you test the response to vaccination, you're looking at the antibody titers to uh, Hib, Tetanus and Provenar. In my particular case, the Hib and Provenar response was poor. So I repeated the vaccine again uh, to boost his immunity a bit further, but he had good response to Tetanus, which was good. So he was sort of not too bad. Now, this uh, is a picture taken from the Max Appeal uh, document again, showing you all the facial features. Um, 
Now, we were warning against adenotonsillectomy and grommets on the max appeal document because uh, it can uh, make velopharyngeal incompetence uh, worse. So, VPI is a condition when we say, say certain words, you need the palate, soft palate, to go and touch the posterior pharyngeal wall and make an air seal so that the air is not escaping into, no, into your nostrils. So, if that happens, you'll uh, have a nasal tone to your voice. So, you don't want that to happen. It's very common in kids with DeJoy's to have VPI. So, if you take the adenoids out, you might be actually making the condition worse. So, you might want specialist advice from speech and language therapist before you send these kids off for adenotonsillectomy. Grommets also long term can lead to a lot of problems in these kids because they can have chronically discharging ears and in the long run I think the hearing is worse off um, if you have grommets. So that's again a word of caution but again you have to individualize your case and uh, uh, take it separately. Now um, my particular child had, did not have a cleft lip or a cleft palate but it's really important to actually look for submucous cleft palate. This is a picture of the internet. You can see uh, uh, a submucous cleft palate. It's seen as a translucency in the posterior pharyngeal, uh, sorry, it's on the soft palate uh, when you shine the torch. So it's quite important to actually shine a light as well as feel it, uh, not just one. Again, bifidula gives you an important clue to uh, an underlying submucous cleft palate. Growth is another important thing you need to consider in these patients. If they're not growing very well, then you need to test them for uh, growth hormone, dynamic testing, and see if they need uh, um, growth hormone replacement. Fortunately, that's very rare. Most of them tend to be smaller in the first couple of years of life, but their growth velocity is more important. They tend to be steady. Steady. My particular young man is growing nicely around the second centaur. Now, hypocalcemia is quite common, as I said. Uh, the cal if the calcium level to begin with is normal, keep repeating it every year or so. If it is abnormal, then uh, uh, we have to replenish May A with vitamin D and calcium as uh, we do not have uh, PTH replacement therapy routinely available in kids yet, but it will be available in the future. So this uh, slide just uh, shows you, uh, gives you an overview of uh, what are the problems to expect, which is more or less what we have just gone through. Uh, important thing to consider, which I haven't touched so far, is uh, psychiatric illness. 24% of them, uh, all, all people with uh, De George, will have a diagnosis of schizophrenia at some point in their life. So it's quite important to keep an eye on that as well. So again, um, uh, bringing your attention back to the Max Appeal document is extremely uh, useful, and I would recommend that uh, you go back and have a look at it. It also gives you uh, recommendation for investigation at the initial referral and also follow-up, which is quite useful. And that brings us to the end of this talk. Thank you for listening.